Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Hone and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, Dave and I speak to two paleo artists about doing paleo art. What are the upsides? What are the downsides? And will we ever get around to doing a stegosaurus? Hello and welcome to Terrible Lizards. We have a super duper extra special, gorgeous, dazzling episode because, and it really is dazzling because it is a visual feast which you cannot see. Because we're going to be talking about paleo art, and Dave has a couple of his mates who are going to come on and explain this to us who have their own paintbrushes and everything. Well, they're already here. I mean, they're not even going to come on. <laughs> they're, 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 he- they're here well, already. Indeed. I can see them on the Zoom. Yes. And and now I've realised already that I don't know how to say Nati's family name. <laughs> I, I wouldn't worry about that. I think it's fine to leave it out altogether. You know, I have some theories, but I also don't either. My apologies. <laughs> Is it, is it, is, I'm, I'm going to say, is it Papuriat? No, no it, it, it's put up, Pipat. You were almost there, but, uh. Sorry. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I've only, I've only known you for what, about eight, nine exactly. years. <laughs> well, look, it, it's absolutely fine because I, I'm not very, I'm not very fond of it either. I'm perfectly happy, uh, using Himapan instead, which a lot of people have been, you have been doing, actually. You are known by a number uh, of yes. names in that regard. I think it's fair to say in different <laughs> venues. So, yes, yeah, so we have, we have, we have Nati, who people may know as Himapan and other things and we have daniel dufault is That's that correct. right you said it yes better Again, than I, sh- I should have double checked <laughs> that as well <laughs> yeah who is at the rom the royal ontario museum in in canada and i thought the contrast between the two of them would be particularly informative because yeah danielle is permanently in a museum which there are very few paleo artists who are in that kind of position you you are based in a museum and have been for a long time and mm-hmm. i think it's fair to say that most modern paleo artists professional ones are not right and Nati, as well as doing love in the time of chasmosaur's blog and podcast and having written extensively about paleo art and draws lots of dinosaurs is also working on a book out at some indeterminate point in the future question mark that's right yes i've taken to call it <laughs> i've taken to calling it the everlasting book um simply because <laughs> i have no idea um when that's going to happen but yes <laughs> <laughs> I think that could be appropriate as a running title. I mean, everlasting in the sense of history. These, yeah, life. history itself, right. and yeah. not only dinosaurs, but prehistory is everlasting in a sense, in the <laughs> yes. way that we we bring it forward. So that's true. Yeah, <laughs> Without, so, I'm, I'm 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 a little afraid of of um, the implication, though. If if we did go with such a title, somebody might think that uh, uh, that we were referring to. Uh, the longevity of the book itself, which <laughs> will probably sound pretty arrogant. Um, so <laughs> I was very disappointed when I got to the end of the never-ending story. So oh, yes, because uh, yeah. that that does happen. Uh, so as I think you get as away was Lionel Hutz famously. So what? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so we, I wanted to talk about paleo art. So we got a couple of paleo artists on. There we go. Let's start again. <laughs> That'll be a quicker intro. There we go. How much would you say, let's go with Danielle, how much, when they're asking you, say, well, we got this dinosaur, we need some pictures of it stomping around, how much of that is completely from your brain and how much of it is actually based on stuff that you've researched? What is the sort of ratio? Well, it's really funny because the end product of art is that final layer of paint, the those flourishes at the end. But like when you're reconstructing an animal, at least from the perspective of paleontology and paleo art, you start from the bones and work outwards. And what you put on at the end is the skin. It's the feathers, the hair, uh, everything that lies on top of those bones. Unfortunately, we don't actually have those things preserved in most cases. You say unfortunately, but I reckon that's quite fortunate in some respects, because surely you can, you know, <laughs> take a bit of artistic license at that point. That's true. That's very true. So I would say like the, the basis and the under 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 art that's a word now under art of the final product is extremely based in science and in um you know back and forth communication with the researchers who really know their stuff um digging through papers and making sure that everything is as close as it can get but when it does come to those final touches and bringing it to life i think we do get a whole lot of freedom and i think that i, I am grateful for it in a lot of senses because it is fun to just postulate and theorize about just how much we're missing about these animals 
animals. The more that I that I delve into, you know, modern biology um, of extant creatures and everything, uh, the more I'm blown away at how just absurd everything is. I mean, everything looks pretty absurd when you when you look when you look closely at it. Well, I don't. I look wonderful. I don't know what. Uh, oh, naturally. I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a strangely hairless <laughs> ape, apart from the few very specific spots where I'm very furry indeed, particularly the top of my head, which I also bleach. Oh, oh yeah, and and my lady fur on my arms. This is this is very furry here. Likewise. Um, <laughs> Why are we talking about my body hair, Dave? Yeah, I, yeah, I think it was because it's absurd. <laughs> yes, um, I mean uh, it is absurd. But the one, the one thing I was going to say off the back of what Danielle just said is, so yeah, obviously, obviously, lots of paleo artists have lots of freedom or expression in what they're trying to do. But as someone who owns quite a bit of original paleo art and a fair bit of wildlife art, and who goes into shops and looks at this stuff and looks through catalogues, there's quite a lot of professionally done stuff, even by wildlife art. Artists. When you look at it, you go, that doesn't look right, particularly for slightly weird animals like elephants and giraffes. And so at the bare minimum for paleontology, uh, though I sort of sure we'll talk about this with certain argumentative features of paleo art, you know, there isn't like a set representation. There is often what I think is in people's heads of what they think these animals look like. But as someone who worked with giraffes for years, I really know what a giraffe looks like. And I often see artwork and go, you've done that wrong. <laughs> and I think the, uh, the average paleo artist doesn't suffer from that problem because <laughs> not many people have got a photo of state or Ipsilophodon knocking around and then going, got the stripes in the wrong place. <laughs> oh, but don't you love those early sketches from the 1800s, you know, from explorers going around the world and bringing them back to most likely Britain? I'm going to Generally assume. it was us, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and just, just having these really awful sketches of like, this is an elephant and I'm pretty sure this is a tiger. And we look at them now and they're just so funny because because we know they're wrong because we have you know we have the internet we have books japanese art of tigers in particular is wonderful oh they really are they're basically just massive house cats and it's like that's sweet (laughs) (laughs) i mean are we doing their mistakes do you think are we sort of go because you know they had a tiger skin and they had a house cat and they put two and two together and they came up with the drawings that you see of japanese and their sort of imperial tigers and they don't look like tigers so here's a question for both of you. What is the thing that you're pretty sure you've got wrong, but is still out there? I think that's a... And what is it about it? And why did you get it wrong? Oh, there's a question and a half. <laughs> it's a, it's a yeah. horrible question. That is a tough one. Um, you've got that triceratops riding a tricycle, and I'm fairly oh. sure that... <laughs> <laughs> what? what? You're saying that can't happen? What are you saying, Dan? I, I, I think it was a tandem. It's a... <laughs> Uh, it, it was a, a tricycle, yes. Um, yeah, uh, in reference to to the three horned uh, uh, animal itself. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's obviously a very obvious example of something that's uh, completely incorrect, but uh, but which was clearly um, just drawn a, as just a light hearted um, uh, piece of work. Um, but that, but that, that's a different. I mean, what is it about a triceratops that couldn't cycle? <laughs> On a tricycle, apart from them being quite far apart in time, <laughs> physically, could a triceratops? No. Have got the anatomy to sit, oh, no. You'd have to be an extremely <laughs> custom build. Uh, exactly, yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. But, but, but on, a, on a serious note, though, um, I don't know. I, I can't think of something... <sighs> I mean, uh, the the only extent I would go uh, in answering that question is that that I don't know any that, that anything that I've done is actually correct. But it's not um, it's not quite your question, which is, um, do I know f- for certain that something is is wrong? But uh, but we just did it anyway, which I, I don't think quite serves uh, the purpose of why we do it, um, unless it were a satirical cartoon. <laughs> What about you, Danielle? Do you have a <laughs> one that you can think, ooh, they, they, that's changed since I first drew that? Hmm. Well, there is one prime example. Uh, it was a reconstruction that I did for the press release of Hero Raptor Temertiorum, which was by David Evans and the, the ROM crew here. And this reconstruction, based on you know their, their own guidance, it did not have flight feathers on the arms. <gasps> the, the hands were not, you know, well feathered. They were... They 
they were more geared for the the sake of grasping and yeah the whole grasp and slash thing but this was just before the papers had come out on um which one was it after all that that had the the first microraptor was one of the microraptor gui probably had the first really good primaries which of course we all thought was a glider but it also had implications for others um and i guess the velociraptor quill knobs as well because that was something that definitely wasn't gliding but clearly had very big primaries yeah so i think it was just before the velociraptor um quill knobs really was published and everyone was very upset with me because (laughs) i looked like a big old amateur not putting flight feathers on so this dinosaur this this theropods um for those of us who are not familiar with it what how big is it what what was it because not everybody's familiar with the story okay right so uh akira raptor temertiorum is a dromaeosaurid from the hell creek formation and it was quite a bit smaller than um velociraptor velociraptor yeah yeah definitely smaller than velociraptor uh its head was only about this long it was like probably 10, more the size of your yeah like yeah. the size of your house cat more well a long very long house cat but yeah big, or a big cocker chicken. spaniel perhaps yeah uh, yeah comparing to a chicken is probably more like more uh, appropriate a turkey perhaps <laughs> Anyway, um, a small predator, but a a very efficient one nonetheless. And um, yeah, this was, you know, it it was an example of uh, what was known to science at the time and quickly became irrelevant because that changes constantly in paleo art. And that's honestly one of my favorite things about it. I I love that we can be wrong all the time. And I hope that we are as absurdly wrong as these uh, Japanese tigers, as you mentioned earlier, because I think it's it's great that we get to keep reinventing the wheel and discovering more, and but there's always going to be a need for more art. And it's it's that constant change. So I've got, as I say, I've got a bunch of originals on the wall of my office. One of which is a Doug, a Doug Henderson um, ornithomimosaur. So it, it's 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 gal it's Gallimimus, and it's oh, wow. completely scaled. And I've I've put this online before, and people are going, "Oh, why have you bought that when we know they had feathers?" And it's like because he's an incredible artist. And at the time that he did this artwork, right. this is what every paleontologist in the world would have told you they looked like. So it's a piece of its time. There, yes. it, it, it's not trying to be something now that it wasn't then. And people don't get that. And as a, a, as a broader point, you, you know, I, I think there's two sides. I, to say, I, I think lots of people think there's kind of two sides to paleo art in the sense that there are people who are trying to make as accurate as possible a reconstruction of a fossil animal environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with obviously the limitations, as Daniel said, that we, we don't have all the details. And then there are people who are just making artistic representations of extinct animals. Right. And I think lots of people conflate the two and they're not the same thing thing if you want to draw t-rex in a jurassic park t-rex style and then give it flame patterns up the side knock yourself out because you're having yeah. fun <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and, of course. and and people go mental over things like that and go it's not accurate it's not supposed to be and it's not trying to be the problem oh. comes when people are trying to be accurate and claim accuracy where it doesn't exist but people mix those two up and yeah i've been involved in some fairly awful cheap and nasty dinosaur books where it's like yeah you know that arm's twice as long as it should be and it's got <laughs> the wrong number of toes on it and that you've said we consulted scientists because you yeah. haven't because you didn't change it when i told you it was wrong <laughs> Oh, to add to that point, I mean, there's a reason why I don't participate much in paleontology or paleoart groups, because I think there is this like problematically obsessive culture of yes. of what people think is accurate, where all of it, like, mo- most of what people claim or will defend till their last breath as being accurate is really just science's best guess right now. Hmm. And I, I just don't enjoy that kind of, uh, I don't know. Gate. Yeah, it's aggressive gatekeeping. And I don't want to but, be a part of that. But but also misinformed. Like I I wouldn't agree with it anyway, but yeah, I've seen vicious arguments and been dragged into them over people who are <laughs> flat wrong about what they're arguing about. And it's like if you're gonna gatekeep, it would help if you at least knew what you were talking about. I think I think the um aquatic spinosaurs where they're underneath oh, the water geez. with bubbles coming up. Those ones are particularly... I mean, because they look amazing and they're really fun, but you're just like, that, that 
doesn't seem quite correct. Well, it, it, it goes back to that bigger kind of issue of, again, hinting at what Danielle said just a minute ago of like the, I guess, what, what, we, what we think is probably true, what we know isn't true, and almost everything else falls in the probable to implausible. And exactly. it's like, again, Spinosaurus, like I've said, I don't think Spinosaurus is this active pursuit predator that's swimming and diving a lot. But that doesn't mean Spinosaurus never ended up completely submerged. I've seen lions right. go completely underwater. If you want to paint a lion underwater, you can, because it did it. I'm sure Spinosaurus ended up 10 feet or more underwater sooner or later and grabbed a fish. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so paint it. There's like, this amazing this amazing set of photography of, um, I think it's a, a jaguar. That's yeah, yeah. Just the diving, one... and he's just snarling with the most ridiculous expression. And yeah, like you could you make paleo art like that. You can't say that that was impossible to happen. Yeah, I guess it's. <laughs> I guess it comes down to th- when it comes to reconstructions, when people are trying to be accurate. If that is your sole representation of the animal, everyone will take away from that that that's that you know that that's like it becomes like the representation. Yeah. You know, and so you you see things like well, you're you're you did Zool, didn't you? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You, you, you see something like Zool. So this wonderful ankylosaur that we talked about. We had Ralph on in series one because he did made the cake of it. Um, oh but, yeah, the Zool cake. Yeah, <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it amazing? There, see, there's paleo art that people don't talk about. Dinosaur cakes. But that's the thing. It's like Danielle's original Zool was kind of like green with a slightly yellow undertinge. And then the next 50 images, if you find of it on, on Google image search, they're all green with a yellow tinge because everyone's gone, ah, that's Zool. And it's not Zool if I don't paint it in the colors of that original mm. one when it first came out. And yeah, and <laughs> that that's where things start going wrong. Not that we're pushing that, but that's how people perceive these things. But the trouble is the public doesn't know. I mean, I don't know what bit of a drawing is going to be accurate and what isn't. So from what Danielle was saying before, the accurate bits will tend to be the size, the way, I mean, presumably the way it's moving, you're not going to put it in a position the animal couldn't physically hold because you've got to be able to draw those muscles that are, you know, skeletally attached somehow. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be in a sort of relatively lifelike position, we think. And then the actual other bits of it, I mean, presumably if it's got really elaborate feathers, that there might be some sort of, you know, scientific evidence to back that up. But is there is there a way? Could you cull, could you have a dinosaur and then colour like all of the bits you don't know and like neon green? Do you know what I mean? So you could have bits that you could point to this bit and go, this bit's accurate, but this bit isn't. Or is it just, would that be ruining it all? Danielle? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that there's a lot of examples of uh, dinosaur skin preservation that you can say like, oh, I put these scales exactly where they were found on the specimen and therefore I know this little little chunk of the neck is correct. And then the rest is just, it's still going to be extrapolation, yeah. you know? I mean, I suppose... In an ideal world, um, it would be nice if we could always point to uh, or have an, an, an explanatory ream of notes <laughs> accompanying each illustration that says, no, which is speculation and which is uh, all, etc. But it's... Um, uh, it's not necessarily art uh, in that case. That's that's always going to be. Uh, I mean, that's useful in in a science communication uh, uh, purpose. Um, but but if you are presenting paleo art, it's not. Uh, I mean, it's not a practical thing to do. Well, it's, it's, it's that real difficulty. So I'm, I was thinking of um, did the I did a paper with Mike Habib and Mark Witten of the Pteranodon neck with a shark tooth in it, and Mark did this wonderful illustration of a shark coming up underwater and biting a Pteranodon and pushing it out of the water in what we call breaching. It's, you see sharks do this now and like coming up out of the water because of the strike hit. And we very carefully wrote this in the paper. And in the press Mm. release, we said, the shark is not jumping out of the water. This is what sharks do when they strike stuff on the surface. And 80, 90% of the media coverage, including actual headlines, scientists show shark jumping out of water to attack Pteranodon. And it's like... 
Yeah. We couldn't have made that any clearer. And yet at the same time, I'm not blaming Mark. And sorry, the phrase that I say, I'm not blaming Mark, immediately sounds like I am blaming Mark by saying I'm not blaming Mark. But it's like we could have, ch- or Mark could have picked a different version of that image, which would have lost any ambiguity, but that would then have lost the dynamism and the impact and the interest right. and showing a reasonable behavior. And it's like, how you, how can you fix that? Even if you do attack a ream of notes everyone ignore it anyway. well that's that's it that's it i mean one of the one of the enormous difficulties i have with with completing this book that i'm working on is that i'm constantly aware of uh, all the voices from every direction that are going to object to one thing or another um, i'm aware that i'm i'm needing to please everybody <laughs> And that, um, that uh, to begin with, that includes uh, the public, the people we're going to sell the book to, who, as you say, Izzy, um, may not uh, be as informed uh, about all these things as as artists and scientists are, and they will they not may not necessarily be able to tell the difference between what is speculation and what is uh, based on fossil evidence. Uh, so there's the reader. There's um, uh, every person in in all the the online uh, paleo art circles who are going to tear it to a thousand pieces. <laughs> um, and, and, and everyone will have a different thing to say. And then there's the, the actual people with whom I'm working, the art directors and the publishers and editors, etc., who are again thinking of, of from another perspective altogether, that of uh, what, what's most appealing, uh, you know, what's, what's popular, what's going to sell. Um, and and I'm having to balance the the, the whole uh, okay, but but I think this is a better thing to do because, and they're thinking yeah, but this will be more popular because. So I have, as I said before, a thousand voices that are constantly ringing in my head, and and it is and it is extraordinarily painful actually, um, and it provides it creates an immense wall each time I come to sit down <laughs> and, and decide um, what I'm going to do with an illustration. Um, and th- this is just a short version of things, but, but essentially it's one of the, one of the hurdles um, that are making the progress on this book difficult, I have to say. Um, and and, of, and the, the other thing I had mentioned is the other person I'm wanting to please is myself. <laughs> and... Um, and that uh, that's a whole other uh, set of complications right there. And um, I, ultimately, I just need to make a decision um, when I'm going to go in to create an illustration and just go for it and stop thinking. But unfortunately, that is not <laughs> something I'm capable of doing. <laughs> I wish I could too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that, that but that that's actually a good point. Is that the you know the the commercial interest? So there's yeah. a there's a wildlife artist called Gary Hodges, and I've got four or five of his images. And when he started off in like the 80s and 90s, he was doing butterflies and crocodiles and polar bears and all kinds of animals that people didn't illustrate. I've got this giant Nile crocodile head on the wall, and it's like artists don't paint things like that. And now he basically just does spaniels and sheep dogs and and, and cats because clearly that's what the market wants and he wasn't yeah. selling life-size Nile crocodile heads mm. but he was selling a hell of a lot of puppies and so guess what he draws now and I can't blame him for that but it's so awful that I was buying you can't blame people Dave <laughs> for wanting a nice puppy in their child's nursery versus a giant yeah. Nile crocodile but it, it's that know, bit... got a pretty nice smile and everything they, pretty cute they, they do <laughs> yeah but but it, it, I guess it's that thing is like you know you you do see this online. It's like well, why are you drawing Tyrannosaurus Rex again? Because when you ask <laughs> the museum or the publisher what animal is going on the poster of the exhibition or the cover of the book, guess. <laughs> <laughs> and they're paying me to do it. So guess what I'm drawing? Yep. And um, what is the most pernickety stuff that you've been picked up on? I mean, I particularly want to talk about backgrounds. <laughs> we'll be here all night. <laughs> I know. I know, but we've got all night, so it's fine. <laughs> but it is, it is that sort of um, thing that I don't think people appreciate, because even when you're looking at the background and the geology and the environment, I mean, how much of that do you have to include? I mean, I, you're working in a museum, Danielle, so presumably they just want like a little smile 
smiley face of a dinosaur. They don't want all of the background <laughs> nonsense, do they? Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, I just spent the past year creating several massive murals, um, depicting every little detail known about these uh, these particular formations. And yes, those details really do matter when it comes to uh, trying to create something that's going to be like installed at a major institution. They want it to be really representative of, of all the work that's been done on this place. So yeah, I, I had to really, you know, reach out to all the all of the um, researchers that really specialized on it and make sure that I'm that I'm doing it justice. Um, when it comes to reconstructing an animal uh, for the first time, you know, and and if that's going to be like a press release image or something, then sometimes they just want the animal and none of the the background fluff. Sometimes it's just an isolated portrait, and those ones are nice and straightforward. But um, I could, I think it all depends on what the intent is. Yeah. <laughs> Natty's just, you know, they just went, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Nothing to add. That's no, 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 I, I, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, I, sp- I suppose the first thing I should have prefaced um, this whole uh, interview with is that I am enormously underqualified to actually appear on, Disagree. on, on the podcast. Disagree. Yeah, because, lie, lie. Uh, well, well, no, yeah. uh, Natty, what, I've, the, got, the, I got, I've got what, a GCSE in biology. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even really have that, so there you go. <laughs> The, the serious point uh, about about saying that is that um, really I would uh, have very little else to add to what uh, Danielle has to say because she is the real pro here and she is uh, no, apart quite apart from the fact that uh, she's actually situated with the museum and doing exactly the the kind of paleo art um, the rigorous kind of paleo art that is demanded uh, of her um, uh, work. Um, it, I, I haven't done anything uh, close to to that level um, at all. Um, but um, so I, I'm also vastly ignorant when it comes to things like uh, the, the flora, for example, or other organisms living at the same time uh, as whatever it is that I'm trying to depict. Um, so there are huge gaps uh, in my knowledge. And um, but she's rubbish at tricycles. I'm sure she's rubbish at tricycles. I but just wanted I, to say that I mean, artistically, you are you're light years ahead of wherever the heck I am. Um, I feel like every time I have to paint something, I need to relearn to paint. I'm still struggling to find that kind of consistency in my own in my own work. Whereas you you can approach any subject and turn it into a just completely delightful masterpiece. And uh, I admire your your skills enormously. I just want to put that out there. It's very kind, Danielle. Thank but, but you. I'd also add to to that to Natee's point though that. Like that's true of lots of us, though, because I get stuff like this on Reddit and stuff. They go, "Oh, Dave, what are all the animals in this formation?" It's like I don't have the first clue. No, like even <laughs> even things like Solnhofen pterosaurs, in which I've done a huge <laughs> amount of work and revised some of the taxonomy. When I'm starting a piece, it's like, "Oh, I should write something about that." I go onto Wikipedia and look at the list because I can't remember them, and I can't remember exactly which ones in which subformation or which in which ammonite mound zeta and was found in which quarry because no one does that oh, you always unless you're darren nage you <laughs> have to sit down and look up <laughs> a list yeah. somewhere and just start going through a book like we we mentioned zool and yeah i i gave ralph a little bit of help with his cake i was like i gave him i sent him some photos and a couple of other things um but he said like what are the plants are around and it's like i haven't got a clue There's and i just beautiful pulled leaves. a book Book off the shelf oh, yeah. and just went through it, and it, you know it was um, uh, it was the Phil Curry's Dinosaur Park book, which okay isn't quite the same age as Zool, but it's pretty close, and so I was just able to have a flick through and go, here's a list of genera, you can look them up. And it's like, but I wouldn't have known any of them. <laughs> like I, I, I think there were pines, and then I'm in trouble. <laughs> so is that is that? I mean, you're saying Danielle, you go, oh, beautiful leaves. Is that what you then go for? So if you've got okay, we've got all of these plants that we know about that have to go into something. So do you pick? the ones you kind of want to draw over maybe the more common ones or oh god i wish i could uh <laughs> obviously i need to represent the things that we know are there but uh for the sake of the murals that i made with the zool exhibit um i not only chose to reconstruct
construct those those leaves as as um, as full trees and plants. But I also supplemented that with some dinosaur park material because that was analogous. Um, yeah, and you know, a, a lot of this ends up being back and forth conversation with the people who are making the art for. It's not these these choices are not yes. entirely mine, and I'd say most of them aren't at all. So can I um, ask you guys about like can, can we? Because I think quite a few people listening to this will be amateur paleo artists who might not be familiar with our podcast, but might sort of click on this and think, hey, I want to be a paleo artist. Sort of where do I begin with all of that? And what I quite like about you two is one of you is very artistic in the sense that you draw more from the things that you want to represent. And you, Danielle, are very artistic, but you are drawing much for a very strict audience in that it is the museum and they want you to represent them, not represent your wonderful skills. So I'd love to know how you both got going in art in general and then why you steered in this direction. Um, Natty, can we go with you first? Um, yes. Well, um, uh, I'm not, as it were, born and bred, if you will, uh, in, in paleo art. Uh, this isn't um, where I originated. My um, regular work, shall we say, is um, in illustrating mostly children's books and things like um, uh, literary fiction. Um, so um, the the whole paleo art thing is just because I have an interest in uh, in the natural sciences, and 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 I love drawing animals uh, and and to dinosaurs among them, and it just kind of this was uh, I wouldn't say it was a late development because I've always drawn dinosaurs, but. I suppose the, a more concentrated effort at drawing them uh, is is pretty late. That came later, and it was done, as you said, without. Um, uh, I just did it for myself. Uh, I didn't. I didn't come to paleo art in order to sell myself as a paleo artist. Um, I had no pretensions at all in wanting to be uh, a paleo artist in, the, you know, a bona fide uh, paleo artist who gets uh, their work put in museums and and uh, and and all that sort of thing. I, I that didn't matter to me because I just wanted to do them for myself. Um, and I've been lucky in that um, since I started doing them in earnest, um, that people have been interested and people like uh, real paleo artists like Danielle and real uh, paleontologists like Dave um, has been, you know, have been interested in my work and actually wanted to look at them. That's, you know, that was just a, an added bonus for which I'm grateful. Um, and, and, then, and then getting the chance to do this book of dinosaurs uh, is wonderful. But um, but it wasn't, uh, as I say, it wasn't at all how, you know, it's not my origin story. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so how did you get into, just very briefly, how did you get into doing children's books and being an artist? Are you, did you, because I, I, I don't know um, your background at all. Did you train? Have you been to art school? What's 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 the background? Um, yes, it's it's just, it really is just something I've always wanted to do, to, to illustrate books. And I just went straight in. Um, my education was was targeted towards it. Uh, I, I studied art in school and then went on to do illustration at, at university. I, I was very lucky then to pretty much almost immediately uh, start working on books as soon as I graduated. So nice and easy. So it's it's very oh, yeah, easy to get a career great. in the illustration. There we go. Lucky, no. <laughs> sickeningly talented. <laughs> That's what lucky means. No, lucky, lucky. No, it really was. No, it was honestly. And it, and it's been. It's obviously as with everything else. It's been up and down. Uh, it's been down of late. Uh, no, making uh, no bones about it. Uh, that's another story, I suppose. Uh, and also because I'm, I'm uh, a lot of it to do with with um, my own pretty limited capacity to do things these days. Um, but that's hey, you're on a podcast. That's you're another podcast. another you're expanding. This is this is on the way up. <laughs> I keep trying to convince Dave of this. Thank you. He's he's always cynical. So w what about you, Danielle? Did you I mean, did you background in art, background in zoology? What are what is your background and how did you get into drawing, you know, rah rah monsters for museums? Well, my formal experience in education is in illustration. Um, but I was definitely torn from a young age whether I wanted to pursue art or if I wanted to pursue biology. And uh, natural history was all is something near and dear to me. Um, there were Devonian fossils in my backyard, and that obviously sparked something from a very young age. Um, there are pigeons in mine. 
Oh, I mean, there are they're relic. dinosaurs. They're dinosaurs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Some of them have really fluffy feet. They they're do. really cute. They also have weird eye markings, the wood pigeons. Their irises are slightly coloured to make it look like their eyeballs dropping, which is kind of odd. Oh, anyway, that's got nothing dropping. to do with your... Oh. Yeah, that's got nothing to do with your, your excellent education and sl- torn, torn, frustrated scientist slash um, artist. Um, I guess where I was going with that is uh, I've never been... I guess I think I've always been lacking a little bit of that um, pure like creative spark to make something beautiful out of nothing. I've always I've always wanted to draw something that I could like tangibly comprehend. Are you a bit like an octopus? You know how they catch octopuses? They just put clay pots on the bottom because octopuses like to be constrained. So it's like your Ooh. creativity, just like a just a thing that no, I need walls, I need boundaries. Yeah, like give, give me a, give me some boundaries. Yeah, I, that's like my my small mammal in me it was like give give me a place to huddle. Uh, where was I going with that? Um, Sorry, right. I, I do like this. Devon- we, were, we were on Devonian fossils and then it really derailed rapidly. Like an octopus, I'm just lacking a few arms uh, <laughs> and maybe maybe some brains. <laughs> they do have a lot. Not, not enough hearts. Wiggly <laughs> yeah. eyes. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like from from a young age, I was my preference was to be drawing things that I could see in front of me, and um, you know sometimes it'd be catching bugs or um, just still lives. Um, most of it was all kind of natural subject for me. Uh, I I eventually did fall deeply in love with all things fantasy and sci-fi, and uh, in the off time, I mean, that's that's more the kind of stuff that I like to delve into because um, I can still use like can still use my knowledge of uh of biology and his- natural history and all those things and apply that to fantasy subjects but um my my love for dinosaurs kind of grew at the same time or not just dinosaurs natural history in general it grew at the same time as my my interest in that grew so i felt like they kind of they kind of occupy the same part of my brain because natural history is just like the fantasy that our whole planet has gone through i think people are obsessed with dinosaurs the same way that people are obsessed with dragons yep and uh, i might i might be one of those people <laughs> she admits <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm, a fr- yeah. I'm, a, I'm a friend with, you know, a few um, curators of museums in the UK and um, quite a lot of the sort of Iron Age people are a bit, they'll deny that they think dragons exist, but secretly you know that they're just a bit obsessed, too obsessed with dragons and where they <laughs> might be located and why they, why people were drawing them. And Yeah, yeah. Oh, the question of why people were drawing them is kind of interesting. super fascinating, interesting. right? Interesting, yeah. Because our, our knowledge of dinosaurs has grown enormously in the past 100 maybe 150 years but doesn't mean they weren't already there at the surface before that so um i'm sorry i've completely gone off, off how did you get into drawing dinosaurs was the original question some <laughs> so, <laughs> back, back, okay. back in the triassic <laughs> <laughs> I ended up choosing to go the art way um, instead of the, the, you know, straight to science way. And I went to university for technical illustration. So scientific and technical illustration is what I did my bachelor degree in. And um, I got this opportunity to go and do an internship during my last year. And um, I never I never thought that I would actually make my way into paleontology because that seemed to me like, oh, only, only the chosen and get to go to space kind of thing you know like gotta be someone very specific but um i kind of i i was looking forward to working in um biology and you know doing anatomical textbooks stuff like that but then this this job posting for the royal ontario museum came up and it was for a technical illustrator uh working in david evans's lab uh, which is the dinosaur lab at the rom and um i spent about two months hardly sleeping and making the best portfolio I possibly could uh, to try and get that job because I'm not I'm not good with decisions but when I saw this I was like this is this is it this is the one I gotta get this no matter what they took me on for the and that was in 2011 so and it's as of this year now is a decade I've been at the ROM for a decade wow. because I dug my heels in and uh, I kind of kind of created a position and it's not like an official official position by any means they keep throwing funding at me. 
and they have a lot of work to do. So, so they've kept me on. I have, I have a big question to ask. That portfolio, right? What do you include in it? Do you include birds? Do you include crocodiles? What are, what are your what are your go to you know things that you put in that portfolio? Yes, uh, to all of it. <laughs> um, a lot of it was you know traditional drawings of skulls and different views. I uh, I had I had a, uh, a little rabbit skull that I had found, and I I actually deconstructed the whole thing, and I created an exploded view of of all the different bones and how they they assemble and dis- disassemble. You know, just some very technical illustrations of biology for the most part, but also some paintings of uh, different species. Um, none of it was dinosaurs. Like, it was all extant stuff. Like, I did a Gould's monitor in watercolor and included that in there, just trying to display, like, the, the breadth of what I knew at the time. So the main skills that you really need are not only the idea that, you know, a familiarity with the subject, but it's also that you've got that brain that can see things from different angles angles and you can represent that on paper that otherwise is just because otherwise all drawings of dinosaurs would be them a bit like you know egyptians you know walking in one direction yeah kind of squished uh it wouldn't be a 3d <laughs> creature coming at you and it's up to the artist to yeah. be able to take that flat image which a lot of dinosaurs particularly the smaller ones that modern fossils we get yeah, are. just learn to learn to apply contrapposto to your dinosaurs you know <laughs> like give them a little a little lean. Give them, give them just that <laughs> three, quarters, yes. three quarters and then just go all full Caravaggio and be straight ahead with a weird light in your face. And um... But they <laughs> look you, weird when I you do, do that. I do love Caravaggio. Yeah, of yeah. course you love Caravaggio. Everybody loves Caravaggio. I mean, of, of all of us, Everyone loves Caravaggio. Uh, Natty is looking the most Caravaggio because of the darkness and the mood. But <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that, that They're very girl. silhouetted against the backgrounds and, you know, quite sort of, don't know what Natty's thinking. So mysterious. In, indeed. What, what what question should we be asking next, Dave? Do you think have we, we've covered quite a lot here? I'm quite happy. We we have covered quite a lot. I I, I guess one thing we I thought we'd probably do at the start and absolutely didn't is talk a little bit about the kind of history and the context of all of this because you know paleontology as a field really kind of started in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and we've got illustrations from back then. You know, there's the first pterosaur reconstruction. Um, the, you know, there's this famous skeleton known which became pterosaur. Dactylus, and yet there's a someone did a complete reconstruction of it as a living animal, which is fairly inaccurate. But that's not really the point. It, you know, it was that here is a skeleton, and I am trying to recreate that as a living animal to convey initially to other scientists, but very rapidly to the public as well, what we think these things were like as living animals. And so, you know, when it when I think it started, obviously it wasn't really its own field, but I think it'd be fair to say that you know, paleo art is in the modern term, which is a word I don't think has been around that long, has existed mm. for a good two hundred years solid, arguably a good 250 at this point, and yet it's still a very very niche field. But the flip side of that is its impact is absolutely colossal. Even outside of movies, and we, you know, we had David Krentz on a couple of series ago talking about, you know, the Hollywood and you know, movies and big documentary productions. But you know, as as Dan, Danielle and Nati both said, we talk about like press releases. If you want to get your press release of your new dinosaur into the media, you need an illustration. Um, no matter how good your fossil. Obviously, if you have again, we had this series already: Ceratosaurus, Ceratosaurus, Venita. They're bits. You need the reconstruction to show. Show people what they are because um, theropod yes. researchers look at them and go, "Oh, baryonychine from like the tip of the snout," and they know what a baryonychine looks like and what's right and what's wrong and what's interesting and what's new, and no one else does. And you absolutely need that. But even when you've got, yeah, Zool is a great example. They've got a complete skull. They've got most of the body. They've got the tail club. All the armor and all the scales are there. It's still a big block of stone with some oddities to it if you're not used to looking at fossils and they're for people are going to go well what does it actually what does it actually look like and so you have Dear to draw researchers it. yeah Dear researchers <laughs> please don't use stock photos for your press releases that's ultimately it you know yes hundred as you as you mentioned is you know loads and loads of people do it for fun now there's a vast number of people and not just kids adults too who are you know just drawing dinosaurs for fun i did t-rex 
acts as a turkey. No, it's a vulture thing with a wig. Yeah, gobbledy. Yeah, oh, it's horrible. With the, yeah, <laughs> with the wat- I want to see that. The kind of wattly stuff. Um, but yeah, you know, as as a science communicator, he said ironically because we're on a podcast. One of the best ways that I communicate to people is with good paleo art, which goes from you see this mangled dead thing. We actually are very confident that it looked like this, and people will look at that and go, "Oh, I know what you mean." in a way that is never going to be conveyed from that mangled skeleton. Mangled partial mm. skeleton with bits missing. And also, I just, want to, uh, I just want to add to all of this. You have, as well, included in paleo art, all the sculptures, all the toys, even the movies and everything else. All of it is encapsulated in this idea of what goes into the public imagination about what dinosaurs are and therefore adds to all of the stuff that we have to just sweep away and go, no, that's a misconception. Actually, it was like this. Well, that, that's that. You know, I I guess there's a well the megalosaur on our own logo. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Right, you know, there's a good example. That's classic old paleo art. That's you know what we're saying about outdated stuff that was. Well, I'd argue that that was fairly wrong even for the time, but it's. But, you know, you know, things change. But I guess it goes back to that kind of what the heart of what paleo art is or isn't. And there was a big thing about this on Twitter, I want to say two or three months ago from the time that we recorded, um, with people really arguing about this. And obviously there was lots of people going, well, this is what it should be. And it's like, well, life doesn't really work like that. But it, it comes down to that dichotomy between people who are striving for accuracy for whatever reason and people who are not and the conflation of the two. Um, And yes, it's therefore easy to get annoyed when big toy company puts out absolutely disastrously awful model as part of their big toy line (laughs) and therefore gives people the impression that no, no, this is a good representation when it isn't versus people, Mm. well, like Matisse, you know, his his Emily Bronte Saurus illustration where I don't think anyone thinks that sauropods wore little Victorian bonnets and sat at writing desks. Um, but they should. Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, obviously. And if you if you can get Dave to remount Futalongosaurus like that, I would be delighted <laughs> in the main hall of the ROM. Um, yeah, and it, it's that conflation of those two different things that, that causes more grief than I think anything else. But that goes back to what we're saying about do you need to attach notes? Even if you do attach notes, people will ignore it. It's, yeah, mm. it's horrible. <laughs> I mean, I, I just love the example you gave to people not reading the notes. It was about jumping the shark. I just think that's... Oh, I yes, very that's... good. <laughs> there you go. Very good. But yeah, it's, it's paleo art has this extraordinarily rich and important history. And, you, you know, people like Charles Knight, who did the famous murals in American Museum of Natural History, which was like every book when I was a kid and, and older books. You know, you look back into the 40s, 50s, 60s, if there was any single book and it's like here is the history of life and it's just that classic mural of going a lot and the zalinger mural as well the other big one you know it's that the time going from left to right and all the plants and animals changing that was just it there was uh I'm definitely not going to say his name, but Zdenek Burian. Zdenek Burian. Is that about right? Burian. Burian. Okay. And he was yeah. from, I'm going to say Czech, but I'm not sure I, I actually know. He oh, was yes. Czech, was yes, he? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. You know, massive illustrator. God, he did hundreds, thousands of images. And again, from the 70s in particular, if you owned any dinosaur book almost anywhere in the world, it was Burian's illustrations that you'd have seen. And that's what completely drove everyone's mental image was four or five people um, for about 50 years, which is just extraordinary. And now we're in the complete opposite position where we now have tens of thousands of illustrators pretty much on right. deviant art and places like this putting their stuff up. It's the, the shift is unbelievable. Um, and yet, look at, the, look at the chaos it causes. But in a sense, it's the more the merrier as well. I mean, because... It just gives you more variety, and it means that our two d- guests can just shine. <laughs> it is, um, and I, I just love, I just love looking at all the deviant art stuff and looking at the stuff that gets put on Instagram, and it's, uh, there's loads of it, and it's really cool. We were going to give a shout out to somebody, Dave, who did a drawing. Uh, Bob was- Nichols. Yes. Bob. Bob. So yeah, we we in our oh, yeah. we did the Satakosaurus episode, and Bob quite rightly admonished me for not mentioning that he did this live size reconstruction of the really famous Attackosaurus specimen that we talked about down to nice. pretty
pretty much every individual scale because we've got pretty much every individual scale on it. And it is unbelievably magnificent. And it was wrong of me. And I made bad Dave for not mentioning this at this at the time. Um, but yeah, there, there's a great example. And it's also a, a good example of the integration of um, science and art. Bob is on three, if not four, scientific papers. Um, and he's he's done kind of both things. So Bob's on a couple of papers about Cetacosaurus, describing the details of those scales and the patterns and potentially what that means in terms of camouflage and stuff like this. But he also... Did, uh, he... Honourable mention to the butt. Yes, the cloaca. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, with the cloaca. Sorry. Yep. Um, yes. <laughs> And then he, he's also on a paper with um, a mate of mine, Don Henderson, at the Tyrrell Museum, where Bob did this illustration of two, I think it was called Car- was it? No, it was Giganotosaurus, wasn't it? I think it was two Giganotosaurus, so two really big theropods, picking up a baby sauropod and basically ripping it in half. Lovely. And- and Don took a look at this and went, I think the num I think that doesn't quite work, because Don's a real mathematical biologist. And Don and Bob sat down together and calculated well, Don calculated like the lifting load of a pair of Giganotosaurus of that size and how much the sauropod must have weighed, and found out that it was a little bit too big. And then Bob rescaled it, and there's a new and they published a paper on this with this new slightly rescaled version of a baby sauropod that was light enough enough to be lifted up and ripped in half by a pair of Giganotosaurus. And and Incredible. that is to say could happen. But that is where art can drive into these things. And it is this absolute two way process. And I think yeah, we didn't touch on that with what Danielle was saying of, you know, there's there's feedback left and right, but it's it's not just scientists going, I need to illustrate this for the press release. It's it's about the hand, I need a close up of the hand, or we're doing this mural and I want to show that this, this and this tree are there, so make sure they're relevant relatively in the foreground so I can write a notice about it. The artists are feeding stuff back into the science actively. Bob is not the only person who's been um, in papers like that as a result of that kind of collaboration. It, it, it is absolutely two-way and increasingly so. Um, and I think that gets overlooked and the, the work of the artists going into that science as well. It's not just it's not just the front-facing communication of here's a beautiful artwork, look at my dinosaur and now pay attention to the press release and the science. Yeah. It, it is yeah. integrative and collaborative. Well, I think um, you've advertised Bob enough that we need our <laughs> artists on here to give all the details so people go look at the work that they do. Um, so, um, Natty, where can people see your artwork? When is your book going to be out? And what's it called again? Plug everything you can possibly plug right now. <laughs> well, at the moment, there is only um, my my social media, uh, which is, uh, well, the handle is, is Himapan, and it's uh, the same on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and, How'd you spell that? Uh, it's uh, oh, forgive me. <laughs> it's it's H I double M A P double A N. We can probably put it on your show notes um, as well. We will put it on I, the show notes. I think we'll I already definitely have. put it on the show notes. Safe. And um, but yeah, I don't have paleo art in publications at the moment. Um, the but you're going to. I'm going to. But but God mm. knows when that's going to happen. Um, so, and I I don't <laughs> want your. I don't want to put uh, uh, people's expectations and hopes up too much for that uh, for the moment. Well, when it's um, out, you need to make sure you send Dave a note and we will tweet a storm about it and hopefully put it on the podcast as well. Thank you. So- I, I promise to do that. Um, but but uh, there is one uh, uh, pretty exciting bit of news, though, in that I will have uh, probably my first illustration in a museum, um, <gasps> uh, and it's going to be opened uh, on the 16th, I believe. Oh, that's great. And that's at the, the North Dakota uh, Geological um, Survey. So, and it's and it's an illustration of it in Montosaurus because uh, Dakota, the famous uh, uh, oh, the mummy. in Montosaurus mummy, exactly. Yeah. Uh, there is a new exhibition about that, and uh, and all the new material that they've been working on these past few years, which includes, um, among other things, this beautiful uh, preserved hand of the hadrosaur of the well of the Edmontosaurus yes. uh, with the with evidence of two claws, one of, one of which is a huge and, and weight bearing one. And um, but anyway, uh, yeah, that'll be. And the others are dialing on the mobile phone. <laughs> it, it looks poised to do exactly that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say we're not giving anything away because this is this is out there. Yeah. But, like this is amazing. Like the the three middle fingers are like bound together 
to form like a f- one functional toe with one giant claw on the end. Madness. Yeah. <laughs> The oven glove dinosaur. Yeah, basically. <laughs> the oven mitt. Um, so it's Danielle, so much weirder tell us... than you could have assumed, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I love it. Let's let's hear your plugs, Danielle. Where can people see your oh, stuff? Other oh, than geez. the museum, of course. Are you on social media? Barely. I'm really, really you've, bad. You've got a website, whole... though. I, I do, and that's not very good either. Oh, um, <laughs> goodness sake. Stop it's being several. Modest. It's a few years out of date. That's fine. <laughs> Past Danielle was nearly as good as current Danielle. <laughs> she was. <laughs> you we're about the same really uh so it's it's ddufo.com yeah, very simple so d d u f a u l t yes dot com. and i should probably get a new url because nobody knows how to spell my last name nobody knows how to spell izzy either but i'm keeping it because i got izzy.com so yeah. uh yeah so i have a very out of date website that i really need to update well you've got a chance now yeah you know, we'll, this won't be out for a few weeks so there you go get busy i already am though <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my social media is all under Mesozoic Muse, uh, where I very rarely post on Twitter, but should probably start doing so again. Why not? Just just to say, I like the look of your claws. There you go. That's what you need <laughs> yeah. to do. Or the occasional rawr. Um, so oh, guys... Everyone needs that. It, well, no, indeed. At the end of every episode of Terrible Lizards, we like to do a dinosaur rawr. Uh, as a way of saying goodbye. No. So I would love it if you guys would join Four us. Four way, yeah. A four way row. Okay, and remember, this is art, it's music, it counts, okay? So try and be as representational as possible of your favourite dinosaur. And after three, one, two, three. Rawr. 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 <laughs> this episode of Terrible Lizards was made possible by our generous patrons on Patreon. To support the show and for bonus content, please go to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. For links to everything, including merch and past episodes, go to terriblelizards.co.uk. Please follow us both on Twitter. I'm at ISZI underscore L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E and Dave is at D-A-V-E underscore H-O-N-E. Send us your questions either via Patreon or terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. If you can't afford to support us on Patreon, please do write a review and recommend the show to your friends. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to us. 